don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Horror Hour TV. We all go a little mad. Get you. Hello and welcome to the very first episode. This show is something that kind of started off as a little idea in a group inbox and then I was like, no, this shit's really happening. And so we kind of rolled it and and now we're here, which is really exciting. Um, So throughout this podcast, all the episodes, we're going to be discussing all sorts of different topics, everything to do with horror because we're all slightly obsessed. My name is George, and my other two co-hosts can introduce themselves right now. Hello, my name is Ben. I am very, very excited to start talking all things horror with these two relics that I have in this podcast. Wow, thank you so much. Mm. Oh, that was polite. <laughs> well, you know, um, as being a relic, my name is Yutaka. I am also a lover of the genre of horror as I say it over here in the States, because, you know, we say it correctly. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's horror. God's <laughs> sake, get it right. Um, but yes, on today's um, premiere episode, we were originally going to be talking about our, getting a little bit of introduction and getting to talk about our favourite horror movies. But then we were like, oh, wait, Friday, just gone, was the release of The Fear Street, or Fear Street 1994, part one of this trilogy of exciting films that netflix is dropping um for us and so we thought well it's only right that we start with our first review of this film so we're going to be talking about what we liked what we didn't like the themes within it what we want to see next from it you know what the next two movies are going to bring and just everything to do with fear street and then at the end because of course it is based on the books by R.L. Stein, we will be talking about our other favourite horror movie adaptations, which is going to be really exciting to see, because there's a lot of them. I don't think you realise until you actually look and you go, oh, wait, there is a lot of horror film adaptations from books um, that aren't just Stephen King. So without further ado, let's delve into this review. So, Yutaka, why don't you go first? Because I know that you're familiar with the um, the source material. Yes. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I am old enough that I have read these and um, I remember them as a teen. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go in with an open mind because I'll be the first to say I'm not a big fan of adaptations. And so they certainly took liberties in this, which I don't mind because they were fun, um, but they still stayed true to the whole Fear Street saga and The Witch, which was so much fun. And overall, I really enjoyed it. Love the characters. Uh, also, that whole surprise LGBTQ plus. Um, like, I was not expecting that. And I love that. Um, the kills were gory. I, you know, you got invested in the characters. I really thought you got time for that. And um, I think the biggest highlight, though, and this is because I'm, you know, grew up in the 80s and 90s, the soundtrack was incredible. I was, oh my God, the opening had, what, three, four different bands that I was like, okay, all right, I'm here for this. So overall, I would say I loved it. I'd give it like, um, I'd give it a nine out of 10 for horror because that's how much I enjoyed it. I also thought it was amazing. It's the type of movie, if I made a horror movie, it's what I'd like to make. It's, (laughs) It's an incredible throwback. You get a great feeling, incredible atmosphere in this film, small town America. 1990s you really get the feeling of dread and they do that very well i do have to say i thought the plot was very similar to scary stories with the witch and sarah bellows there was a lot of familiarity but i understand they're similar by nature however this story was different and it was really really cool i loved the throwbacks to old horror films where where it was either maya hawk um, being the drew barrymore in the opening which I thought was really cool. The different visual throwbacks to Halloween, Scream, Friday the 13th, they did that all really well. It was just enough on the nose that it was not a ripoff. And the story as well, 
took from all of them, but it was also had its own sense of originality so that it did not take from them and it was not a ripoff. It was, I really enjoyed it and I cannot wait. I think it's an incredible experiment for Netflix to do, releasing a trilogy over the span of three weeks. I cannot wait to see what part two brings. Uh, the cast for that also, um, another Stranger Things actress, really, really cool to see her get some work. And the lead in this film, the girl, does anyone have the actress's name? I do, I've got them all written down because I am what? Prepared. Um, mm. it, it, so Which lead? There were two. You got Dina or Sam? Dina. Dina is played by Kiana Medea. Medea? No, Medea. Medea. M-A-D-E-I-R. If she's listening, I'm sorry. Kiana Medea. You're very... Well... <laughs> I watched her in a show called Trinkets a few years ago, and I thought she was incredible in it. And I was so worried that she, I never saw her in anything else. She was never, she never got cast in anything. But then when I saw her in this movie, I was so happy and so relieved because she finally got a chance to show off her incredible acting skills, which she does have. No, I agree. I think the whole, the cast as a whole is a really strong cast, I feel. Like, I, for, in terms of the story, I really enjoyed it. Again, I think it was really fun. Um, it was, you know, it was something that you can definitely want that you watch with friends. It's not, you know, it's your, not, I don't like to use the word cheesy, but it's your classic 90s, you know, late 80s horror slasher style film, which you know exactly what you're going to get with that. But I think with this as well, it could, because it paid homage at times, um overtly homage to scream but i think it was um overall just really fun like i could i would sit with if friends were like oh let's watch a film i'd be like let's watch you know fear street because it's not you know terrifying it's more about the story the characters say the music was um amazing and i loved the opening intro i love there's nothing i love more than an abandoned anything i mean they did all of the cliches in this we had the the mall we had the school the hospital we had you know all of them were in there um so i think it was really nice to kind of and i think that always helps with these types of things is going oh this you know it's the nostalgia like with what stranger things did you know it's the that that nostalgic um those nostalgic thoughts they get you to really enjoy the show character wise Mm um i thought I enjoyed Dina. I thought she was a really interesting character. Dina and Sam's relationship, I really liked. Standouts for me, though, was um, Dina's brother, Josh, who I thought was just so funny. Um, I thought it was a brilliant um, character. I do have one thing, which I will touch on in a minute. And I really liked um, the friends, well, Sam and Kate. I felt like they all had a... Although, obviously, you kind of knew that Dina and Sam were sort of the two main girls, um, I feel like they did a great job with josh and um kate and simon to have them uh, to feel like it was a group dynamic like it wasn't you know an obvious because at i was put at points i was like who's gonna survive and who's gonna die here and when the people did die spoilers um i was very annoyed which is what you want to be but i was like because you cared about them yes like let me tell you kate is an icon that needs to be she was just I absolutely love her. Um, that broke my heart. She, uh, well, well, we'll talk in my pros and cons, but um, yes, I'll let you finish that thought. <laughs> but yeah, overall, I'd say I think just the characters, the whole thing is just, it was just a lot of, like I said to you, it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed watching it and I'm really looking. I mean, the next time tra- trailer, I was like, damn, this looks even better. But yeah, overall, I definitely think it's a strong film. I'm interested to see how it all ties together in the end. But I would probably give it, mm, there's a couple of things again I'll talk about when we get to pros and cons. I'd probably give it an eight out of 10. It was a lot of fun, okay. great awesome. music, but there was, know, there was something lacking for me. Ben, what did you, out of 10, what would you rate it? I'd probably go 7.5 or Ooh, 8. I thought okay. it really was very good. Um, so I liked it more than everybody else, but I still like to hear that that people that you all enjoyed it because that was my as I was watching it I'll be honest I was like I wonder if they will enjoy this as much as I did because one the source material but two and I'll um I will touch upon this um the setting because I can tell you there were a lot of true 90s references that weren't even um that weren't even fake 
that was pro- like uh, the opening bookstore, a B Dalton. That was a real thing. I don't know if it was real over in um, across the pond, but mm-hmm. over here, that was a that used to be like our premier bookstore in the malls. Oh, but the B Daltons don't. They no longer exist. Right. They were only around for the '90s and early 2000s. So when she's like working in a B Dalton's, like, oh my god, I know that. I. Fit. I was like, I, I'm in. Okay, let's do this. Mm-hmm. And even in as she's putting books away, those were aside from the author they put on it. Those were actual Fear Street novels. I noticed that because I googled the when I was googling Fear Street to see what it was all about at the beginning. I saw the pitch of the novels, and then as soon as it came up, I was like, Oh, so I wrote that down. I was like, They are the books. I, I love those little tiny details because. Um, as a fan again of of the books, I was like, "Oh, I like that little call out. That's great. I love it." Um, but well, since I'm already talking, can I talk about my pros? Yes, go for it. Okay, so I do have to again. I'm calling out that soundtrack because very in the first what maybe ten minutes, I heard Nine Inch Nails closer. I heard I'm only happy when it rains, but garbage. Love that, by the way. Um, Machine Head by Bush. Oh, and there was one other one. Erg. But either way, I'm, I'm looking at the entire soundtrack and it's just a 90s. Um, it's just heaven. You got White Zombie. You got some Snoop Dogg, Cypress Hill. Uh, Damn, I Wish I Was Your Lover by Sophie B. Ha- I- I'm telling you, this soundtrack is probably what elevated the movie more for me because I thought as a... Um, I thought it was a good companion to the actual setting of the nineties, especially it was interesting to see, you know, back then malls were, you know, malls were the thing. So I loved seeing that, but I also liked how you could kind of take it to today where um, shady side was kind of the poorer town um, kind of struggling. And you had um, Sunnydale, which was, was it Sunnydale? Oh gosh. Yeah. Uh, and they, uh, you know, it was rich. Everything's happy. Everything's gorgeous. It looks wonderful. And I loved that comparison. Sunnyvale. Sorry. Sunnyvale. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Buffy Sunny, though. That's why. I, <laughs> I know. I was, th- I was thinking, where have I heard that? You know, yeah, sun- yeah, Sunnyvale <laughs> and Shady Side. Thank you. It's our first time. I promise, guys. We'll, we'll get this right. <laughs> but. <laughs> So I, I loved that um, realism to it. Um, and again, the characters, you got invested with them. I really felt there was growth. Um, you felt connected. And I was crushed when, you know, two of them were killed. Ah, but one of them was the coolest death ever. So, of course, like her, she had to go out with some gory freaking death because my god i was not expecting that because whew, i don't think anybody was from uh uh rl stein adaptation but read the books it gets pretty gross like that too so my horror heart was so excited even though i knew a bagel slicer would never do that not through a mm. skull but it's okay i accepted it <laughs> For me, I think the best thing that this film captured was that at any moment, I did feel like any of them could die. And that's something incredibly rare for a horror movie and something that I haven't felt since I first started watching them. So I, Because I genuinely did think that because they did open with Killing Maya Hawk and watching the killer be so brutal. Like the, the way that they, they, you can tell that they added CGI to the killers just with the way that they move and function and the way that they look. But it's just enough to kind of add an extra power to them that they feel incredibly supernatural, but very present and scary and physical. So I really did think that at any moment, any one of the characters could die. And that is absolutely the biggest positive I can give any horror movie, which is that not even the main girl is safe because it's such a different kind of story. It's not a typical final girl type thing. So I really appreciated that. I love the atmosphere and I love the characters and I love love those they were very brutal you can tell that they used a lot of practical effects for the blood and what cg they did use was not noticeable i like to a big to a degree you can tell that there was you can tell it was there 
but it wasn't distracting. It, it, it added to the effect of the film and really, really did just. I appreciated the... that, Ben. Mm. Yeah, I'm with yeah. you on that. It, it was big. So me, um, mm. I really liked the world building. I liked the um, the MCU style <laughs> world building that this kind of gave with the, you know, it's not because I was like everything, obviously, because we know, oh, we know it's going to go back, you know, 1978 and 1666, I believe, the other two. I was, when they were mentioned anything from, where it was mainly um, Josh's characters mentioned anything from the past, I was like, right, everything down. I was like, okay, who's, because I noticed that Kate said that her, um, her mum, her mum's sister, which I don't know why she just didn't say auntie, but um, her mum's sister was at, had a connection with um, night, the Camp Nightwing for 1978. And I was like, oh, okay, let's remember that to see if that comes back into play um, and talk about all the other killers and things like that. So that I really appreciated because it's one of those things that you can think, oh, okay, we'll look out for that. And then hopefully by the end of the trilogy, we'll kind of have a fuller idea of um, what's going on. But I really appreciate that. I really, I liked a lot of the... Um, callbacks to film so with the open obviously being scream and i kind of got scream three as well there was a lot of scream references um throughout this which obviously i appreciate because i love scream um from obviously the kill to even when she was hiding in the halloween store and they had the masks and then he was one of the masks which reminded me of scream three with sarah darlin in the costume department um the yes. hospital gave me halloween two vibes you know that there, there was there was a lot, a lot going on, but I think it, I think it did it well without it being they, they did the '90s slasher idea thing well, but they didn't rely on it too much. Like it wasn't, they didn't go into the whole like um, meta idea of horror films and all that, which is obviously quite big in the '90s. Um, so I appreciate that they kind of made it a lot more grounded, but still were able to put those little um, exciting bits in. And yeah, like I say, I really, really liked. The characters and when they died i literally wrote they really did that to my girl case um, but, and then i said and then i put two seconds later oh shit simon too but yeah. it was like so quick yeah because at one point the very i was there was a part at the beginning i was like because obviously there were some um you know non well, supporting characters or not even supporting characters background characters being killed throughout and obviously that's how it works but then i was kind of like mm, oh is anyone at, there was a thought and i think is any are there any of these people gonna die like oh, there was a part of me that thought is this and then they went oh, you want to see people die? Sure, here we go. And so I really um, appreciated that. And I also wrote in the first part, I don't know why, I just, I love neon lighting. So for me, <laughs> the lighting was very, very good. Um, I enjoy I, nothing more than a, a good, strong neon light in a dark room um, that gets me going on a, on a Friday night. So that was very, very exciting. And yeah, as I said, I... Sorry, go on, Nita. Oh, I was just saying, it's very reminiscent of... Over here, we have a store called Spencer's. Okay. I'm not, not sure if you have it over there, but that's literally what that store is. It is um, neon lighting, just all random props, funny gags, all that stuff. And so as soon as I saw it, my first thought was, oh my God, that's a Spencer's. Um, they're not really around that often, but that's truly what, if you were to walk, it could be, you know, bright as day out, but you go into that store, it is all dark like that and it's neon lit. And so it just, again, it brought me back to the 90s. And I was like, oh, my God. It was, I, I loved that detail. So I love that you enjoy that. But it, no buts. It was just, it, it was a good callback to the 90s. It really was. This, I was living my teenage years watching this film. Yeah, it was. It was brilliant. And also one thing I appreciated as well, which I um, wrote down, was I appreciated that in the credits, the CG flies had names. They were called Paul, Christina and Gilmero. So I want to shout out to those CGI flies. I didn't. <laughs> I was watching it and I was like, CG? And then I was like, how have they got names if they're CG? I don't know. Anyway, I appreciated it. I was watching it and I was like, I like that. So, but yeah, I think that to me was an overall of, of my pros for it i did really enjoy it there was a lot to enjoy but i do have questions which may come into the cons or they may actually just be that i haven't been listening so we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and do our cons Ooh. and we're back so now 
three of us, we are going to talk about our cons for Fear Street 1994. And I have to say, I don't really have a lot in that. It's just that the film, it felt like there was just something missing from it. Like, I don't think it can be... It's not the type of thing where it's like a classic classic. I think it's kind of close. But I think it had the potential to truly be like a 10 out of 10, like a pure balls to the walls, just epic throwback. And I think that probably has to do with maybe the director, perhaps if they'd gotten someone a tad more experienced, then maybe it could have had that. But at the same time, it's not that big of a deal because what they did deliver was so solid that I don't really think it's it's that bad. But for me, I only have one other thing, which is that they set up this really interesting pastor character. The I mean, we, we only really saw him once. And I remember he had like the hair down and he looked incredibly terrifying. I just really hope that we get to see him and he's not just teased and we never we never get to explore that character because he seems like he could be the scariest of all of the killers that they have. So honestly, that's pretty much it for Fear Street. I generally thought it was a enjoyable film that was just lacking like a certain magic but it's very hard for movies to get that yeah i i, I do know what you mean i i say i said it 12 about 50 times on this podcast i really enjoyed it but there was some things i was like again i agree with you ben there was something lacking i don't know what it was but i was like i really enjoy i'm enjoying the references i'm enjoying the cast i'm enjoying the story which should become clearer throughout the three but yeah, I don't know. I was watching and I was like, I'm waiting for some, there's just something. I don't know if it's real because it was at one time, it was like throwing so many references at once. And I was kind of like, okay, okay, okay. Like trying to digest a lot of stuff at one time. And then it kind of slowed down. And then the midsection, like after was it Sam's boyfriend, Peter was killed, which that I was like, oh shit, that really made me like jump in the hospital. There were elements that again, may become clearer in the story but so questions that i have which maybe it's not even cons maybe it's just questions um but i was like okay first of all there was this whole situation that the killers were just after sam but then so there were times when they could like they were the group were just standing away from everybody and the killer would walk right past them but then in the hospital the killer killed peter and like the two nurses and I don't know if that was because, was it because they got in the way? Um, but then why if they, why didn't they kill, you know, are they that, maybe it's just me going too deep. Like when they were all waiting for them outside of the bathroom, like they didn't, they just kind of ignored them. And I was just a little bit, that kind of got me a bit confused because I was like, wait, are they, are they coming for just Sam or are they, you know what it, I felt like it needs to be more explained. I don't know if anyone can agree or disagree with me on that. It was a plot hole. It was, I mean, I get they were following the blood, but again, yes. Why did they kill these innocent bystanders in a sense? Like Peter, the boyfriend I get because he was there, maybe literally in the killer's way. Mm -hmm. Um, But the nurse that we, we saw her death, we're like, why? The other guy I get though, because he tried to, you know, interact. I think if you interact, maybe. Mm. But yeah, I did think, uh, yeah. Yes, that was kind of a, that was a plot hole. And then the only other thing that, and again, this could be answered in the next two films. So I'm putting it out there now to see if when we come back to this, if it is. Why did Dina have a nosebleed before they went to the grave? Her nose started bleeding before she threw the stuff. And then, so I was like, oh, okay, what's going on here? This is the, unless it was because they were getting, I don't know, close to the grave and maybe it's something to do, maybe, again, I don't know, because I don't know the source material. So um, maybe Dina has something to do with this. Maybe it is something to do with Dina rather than Sam. And Sam was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because I was just like, that I found that, I was like, oh, she started having nosebleed. And then Sam's nosebleed didn't start until she got, to the grave. So unless this, unless it, again, we might, this might be explored, it was, it was the witch and she was trying to do it so that it put Dina off. And so these whole, this whole thing went into motion. That's a possibility. But again, that was just a question I had. I was like, oh wait. And also I didn't really understand why Dina was about to throw the ice and then 
all, all over the car. But then when she did it and she kind of missed, she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I was like, what, you were going to do it anyway? Do you know what I mean? She was like, oh, and at the car swerved. But I was like, well, you were going to literally throw the ice at them, weren't you not? Mm. Was it because she also, it was just the ice and not the actual bucket? Because I'll say as a driver, maybe, because did she, the bu- she threw the bucket mm. too on accident. Yeah. So did you, would, oh, I didn't swerve, she threw you would swerve out of the way because you wouldn't want that to hit your windshield. It was just ice and water. That might make you jolt a little, but I, pretty sure it was also because they actually threw the bucket and so they didn't want that to hit the windshield okay fair enough i didn't realize it through the bucket i thought she just swung it and then it went like and she was like oh okay so that makes more sense all right so ignore me everybody <laughs> but apart from that yeah i think yeah, there wasn't a lot for me to be you know i don't want to come and shit on this film because i didn't really um enjoy it and like i say i think the world building and stuff is something that i'm really looking forward to and explore and i do agree with you Ben, I'd like to see um, with the pasta character, but I did note down that pasta was in 1666. So, ah, right. I assume he and they said he was the first one. So maybe that is. Hopefully, we will. And I did think, yeah, because the other three they showed them and they were the main guys. And I did think, oh, why aren't they showing this guy? Um, and I thought, oh, okay, and the milkman. Be... Oh, the milkman as well. Yeah, but then I don't know if we'll he looks terrible because the next one it's the Jason looking guy yeah. isn't it with the axe so but yeah in terms of the directing i kind of enjoyed i had a little google because i didn't realize i was like one to know it was um lee lee janik um who directed this and she only done a couple of things previously to this she did one film called honeymoon with rose leslie and harry treadway and i was like that name rings a bell it turns out i have watched that film um i didn't realize until i watched the trailer and I was like, this film really rings a bell. And then I had a little quick Google and I was like, I've definitely seen this film. I'd, I would recommend maybe watching that film. It's weird. Very, very weird. The acting's really great. And there's some like gross elements to it. And also, fun fact, she directed two of the Scream TV series episodes. Oh. You, talk, you haven't watched, have, have either of you watched the Scream series? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't watch the, the season three they did yeah, because was- they left it on a cliffhanger. Well, it was also poorly done. Yeah. Scream Resurrection was dreadful. They were like, it's all right, we've got the original mask. It was like, great, but you haven't got any story. It was awful. It was Um, uh, About the director, though, she is a Scream fan. Yeah. So I I caught the references. So there was a lot. um, But yeah, and I, so I watched, I went back this morning and watched those two (gasps) episodes to see. Which ones are they? So it was season one, episode seven, which is called In the Trenches. So in that episode, it is the one where they go to... Oh my God, I literally just watched it before and I'm like, what did I watch? Oh, it's the one with the abandoned... They, they're in the um, bowling alley. The mm-hmm. bowling alley. That's a great one. Yeah, yeah. that's very and, good. And I was thinking, oh, this makes sense because there was about 25 different abandoned locations in this film. Mm-hmm. So kind of, she likes the abandoned. So that was, I really enjoyed that. And at the end, and that was a kind of this... This was, was like, that when the boyfriend died in that? Yeah, and it was the yeah. thing. And then that re- that reminded me then, ah, I understand Kate's death now because it was very much like that. Yes. With the, whole, with the thing coming at him. And, you know, it was quite... Obviously, they didn't show the whole thing because that was only a 15. But they showed, like, the blood splatter and stuff. That I remember watching that and I was like, Jesus. That was that good. Was... Like, nobody... Ex- well, you expected yeah. it, but that was brutal. Yeah. Um, so it was that one. And then season two, episode nine, The Orphanage, which was one where they were at like a big rave in like a, an abandoned warehouse and that the <laughs> killer was the end of abandoned place. They find Piper's body at the end. Yes, don't they? yes, they yeah. do. Yeah. But also, I thought this week gave me a bit of It Follows vibes as well. I don't know if anyone else got Ooh. that. Like there was, especially with the whole okay. thing with it starting with that kind of um, with the car and then being chased. So I just kind of. Gave me a, a bit of those vibes. Overall, I think it was a lot of fun. So I I really enjoyed it. Does anyone have any other final thoughts on the film before we move I've on? I've got some cons. Oh, sh- I'm, okay. so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's okay. We, we're totally cool, guys. This I didn't shows have the that patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, when you guys were talking about there's part of the story missing and everything... One thing I was hoping they would kind of touch upon because they alluded to it. Um, You remember when uh, the sheriff wrote that little note and they never really. So that that character, Nick Good, is also going to be um, somewhat of a main character in the 1978. Uh, um, 
honestly, which they didn't really touch upon, uh, the whole actual, the, the good family goes all the way back to, in general, in the um, series. So when we see the um, 1666, I believe he's going to be the pastor uh, okay. or um, Solomon. Uh, so it's, I just wish they would have kind of talked a little bit more about the, um, the good family, because that that's a huge part of between um, the fear family and the good family. And they just didn't kind of give that. So I, I was like, well, to me, as somebody who knew the material, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I get it. But I was like, you, you could have given more on that because that I think that would have added to the story. Um, and then there was one maybe technical issue, and maybe it was just me that I thought was kind of silly. But when they were going through um, Sunnyvale and they were looking at all the houses, and they had the lights on. I'm like, I can clearly tell it's just a miniature, and you're just driving like. I, <laughs> it felt a little I was like, okay, this is a little silly now, guys. You could have just found some real town America. I was like that, and it yeah. just looked a little kooky. But I, I got what they were go- trying to go for. Um, and uh, I the other con though, because I feel like um, I think it was interesting that the brother had all these, you know, articles, and he was following it, and he's in this old ass AOL chat room. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh but i'm like oh okay like are you talking i don't know that was just mm, that was odd um that would be the only cons i liked the directing and i say that because it felt like it was kind of one of her bur- first maybe big films mm-hmm. and she is i believe directing all three and so that to me is also kind of nice because i feel that hopefully there'll be some consistency um and my actually my biggest con though i will say i really wanted to see more of the dude with the axe he was terrifying Mm. and i love that which i'm sure we'll see in the next one but he was actually i just remembered something when you were talking about josh one thing that really bothered me and maybe it's because and i did google their ages but this josh and kate relation like romantic thing he looked about 12 to me and she looked about 18 and I was like, this is bothersome to me because I don't know how old he's supposed to be. I Googled it and the actor, Benjamin, is 18. So, but oh. I don't know, he just looks really young. And I was like, I thought oh. I at first they're going for that whole, the younger, you know, the brother who's in love with the, the friend. But then when they did like that scene in, in the toilet, I was like, oh, I don't know. Again, maybe because he just looked so young. They could have filmed um, it before pandemic. Yeah. I know. So I was kind of like, this is just um, a little, I don't know. I just felt it was a little bit, oh. But I really liked Simon's character as well. I thought he was really funny when he kept referring to the Amy Winehouse looking ghost, saying that she was, she was so hot. Yeah. I was like, I like like him. He's quite, he's really funny with the things. I didn't want to criticize the directing too much because if it is as a first time film, it actually is pretty amazing. Um, I, I didn't mean to come off too bad on that. It's probably just maybe the fact that it's one of a trilogy that maybe it's missing. Maybe we'll we'll have more answers soon. Maybe that's mm-hmm. it. But visually, uh, story wise, this film was very well directed, and credit to the director who did an incredible job. For her first major feature. Oh, definitely. And I I that film that she did, Honeymoon. Um, I was watching. That's on Netflix, clips. right? Because I think I need to watch that. Impossibly I know what you're talking about. Is it's ninety nine p on Apple TV, um, if you've got that. But I did. I watched a couple of clips before because I was like, I want to refresh myself. And it wasn't necessarily anything to do with like the directing of that. Like some of the shots and stuff were really, really good. Um, again, I don't want it. To, yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm coming off like. Lee, if you're listening, we think it's great and we can't wait to see the next two. Yes. Um, <laughs> and if you want to come onto the podcast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I say, it wasn't the, the situation with Honeymoon wasn't the directing, it was more the writing. Um, but actually, one of the writers of Honeymoon is said co writer on Fear Street. Um, <laughs> So maybe that's maybe that's the right of that. It's the one who's picking up the plot holes. No, I'm joking. But yeah, um, so sorry, because I cut off you talking before. Does anybody have any final, final thoughts before we um, move on, Ben? It was a great ride, and I cannot wait to 
spend the next few weekends diving into Fear Street and enjoying it. It's going to be a great thing to look forward to. Uh, same as well. I um, I thought it was a wonderful first start. Um, for those who don't know the story, I think it was a, like you said, the world building, I just thought was so, uh, it was so good. I loved the characters. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, and I do love that part of in the books too, never get attached to anyone. And so like then you call that that out perfectly because yes, uh, in the books, no one's safe. So I'm excited to see the um, the next one, which I felt that trailer, I can't believe I'm going to say this, it gave a little bit away in terms oh. of here's the main character, but we're going to show you her possibly get killed. I mean, that looked, yeah. I mean, if she survives it, she survives it, but I'm like, guys, come on. Yeah, I do agree. I mean, I loved the trailer. I mean, I love Sadie Sink. I think she's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yes. And as soon as she, as soon as I saw her in the trailer for um, series two of um, Stranger Things, I was like, she hasn't even spoken in this trailer. I'm obsessed with her. Um, mm. So, and I really, I really love Max's character in Stranger Things. But yeah, I'm really excited to see what she does. Obviously, she's a lot more grown up now, um, and to see her sort of stand alone-ish obviously there's her sister as well but for her to not be in such a, a huge group of, of um incredible actors will be really interested to see but yeah i do agree that and i was like wait which sister's the one that survived because <laughs> one of them yeah. survived and one didn't is it this one i was like i hope it's lady but it seems like she's gonna have a big role um in yeah anyway regardless. she's definitely a lead for sure so i'm looking forward to to seeing what friday the 13th vibes and other um 70s films we get from that and also you know American Horror Story 1984 as well recently last year did their um, yeah. camp one. So I'm really looking forward. To, look like you're about to do a what's the name that I thought you were going to do a whistle tone. Then you tap you put your, you, I did. Oh well, no, no, no. I did want to say before we transition. Yeah. Who um, to the next topic? I have to know <laughs> who was your favorite of the um, killers. Oh, um, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say. Skull face because where this dude. I yeah. really liked the other guy, the axe killer, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing him. I think the girl was the, the, the least interesting for me. So I'm gonna say skull mask. Hmm. Ben. I will say the girl didn't really actually get any kills, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I don't think the star could kill anyone. So that probably would rank her last, but I loved her design. I loved all of their designs. The reason I'm gonna choose skull face over the dude with the axe who's like who's the jason is because skullface we really got a great sense of power from him he had the most amount of kills and he was he was the opening act you know you really got a sense of dread whenever you saw him because i he genuinely did terrify me the way he moved so quickly the way he was just able to stab people like it was nothing because it was nothing like he wasn't alive but it was still such a raw power that i Found terrifying, but I also found the guy with the axe. Oh, he was—he was a hulking beast of of a killer, and I think I'm looking forward to for him to have his own movie in '78. But I would rank Skullface for '94 as probably number one. And this is where we differ. Oh my gosh, mm. <laughs> I love the guy with the axe. Um, I know he wasn't as big of a presence, but every like when he showed up and the way like he moved, I just felt more terrified i loved the um that wasn't like the mask but like this burlap sack over the and the way he called the axe i to me i was like oh that's that's oh that's kind of terrifying i loved the um the skull mask um but i didn't like the design i truly didn't and that's why i was like eh. whereas i felt the uh the axe man we'll just call him for now he had that like I don't know. This is where maybe I'm just a little too gay, but I'm like, those jeans fit a little too tight. And like, <laughs> a little too tight. I was like, okay, all right. But I did. I liked his design from top to bottom because he looked terrifying. Um, whereas Skull yeah. Face was, I was still creeped out because I, I did. I love that opening too, which total scream vibes as we're all talking. And um, one thing that I do, even though she did get killed, and obviously, I loved that some of the things that the characters did to try and get away was smart. I, I did want to call that out 
mm-hmm. when she like kicked off the gate of the um at the shop. Yeah. Like, that's like smart. Yes. Like they they were just I it wasn't like this, oh my gosh, they're good. I don't know how to explain it, but they use their surroundings and they used it to where I thought I would probably do that too. I, I don't know. I just I felt that was real. I, I enjoyed that. I, I agree with that because there was a point, that part when she goes under, I was like, oh, about to get a Tatum and she's about to be like crushed. And then when she did yeah. it, I was like, oh, okay. I like that. So that's what I mean by the fact that like uh, Ed sort of touched on earlier, that they use those homages, but they kind of took them and went, actually, no. Um, it, uh, yes. Uh, so... I know we're talking cons, but, or, or no, we're on killers now, but I just, so I don't know. I, I loved seeing that, but I did. I loved the ax man. So, and yes, the girl loved the design, but you're right, Ben. I kind of felt she was somewhat pointless. Mm. I just, I don't know. I love the design. And I think I, I, I'm interested to see why they went with, her as the third ghost if we're going to be getting um the jason axeman killer um in the next episode in the next movie and it's going to be based on him then should maybe you know if we're only getting three i thought maybe the pastor but maybe they want to keep the pastor for the finale to be yeah. like and they just want to will choose. she be a counselor is she young enough to be like a counselor at the camp <gasps> Ooh, i don't know maybe she was 60 wasn't she though wasn't she? i mean like, i'm not it sure was... yeah check but it looks like the uh, um, the character was Ruby Rachel Lane. Thompson. Oh, Ru- Ruby Lane. Ruby Lane, nineteen sixty-five. I did write it down. I'm sorry. I thought Darn I did. It. I was wrong. <laughs> <gasps> that gives. It's that difficult to say. Yeah, it was. It hurt. <laughs> she might play them again. I think this will be interesting to come back to when it's completed, and we can say we said all this, and actually. We were, well, we, George was wrong because he said so much stuff that came to light. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, for me, just final thoughts. I, I really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to seeing where the next two go. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with our horror favourite adaptations. And we're back. All right, so now we're actually going to talk about our um, the our favorite or the best adaptations from book to film, and so I will let Ben start because I know Ben. I already know his favorite. Do you? Well, see, here's the thing. Um, you'd be surprised when you look into the classics of horror um, how many films are based off of books and other source materials. So you have your The Exorcist, that's based off of a book, The Silence of the Lambs, which is one of my favorite horror films and also one of my favorite films, period, is based off of a book. Uh, Volumes upon volumes, obviously everything Stephen King. So it was actually very hard to kind of find one that was a little bit unconventional. But I did go with the Stephen King adaptation and I did not go with what would probably be my favorite horror film because I'm going to save that for later on down the road. But Don't you, know you dare pick my about. choice. Oh, gosh. But, well, can I guess no, then I, since... I hope I didn't. It is, yes, a Mike Flanagan film. Oh, no, it is a didn't. Netflix film. Gerald's Game <gasps> is probably my favorite uh, horror adaptation. It is... When I first saw that movie, I was completely blown away. Carla Gugino did a phenomenal job... <sighs> Um, really just, and to have a film set in one location be as entertaining and as tense as it was, you really needed a great script, a great director, and a great actress to sell it. And that, that film had all of that. I've watched it maybe four times since, and every time it does hit all the same notes, you get the same sort of sense of relief when you're supposed to feel relief, or terror when you're supposed to feel terror and desperation when you're supposed to feel that. And I really thought that Gerald's Game captured everything it was supposed to and was an excellent adaptation. So for me, the best horror adaptation is Gerald's Game from 2017. You look like you're about to explode, Jutaka. Mm, I hated that film. <laughs> oh. Did you hate this it? Like... Absolutely. How did was... you hate that movie? I thought it was awful. Hold <sighs> on, let me, let me first say though, I thought the acting, I thought Carla 
Gugino, she's always phenomenal. I can't think of a time where I don't enjoy her. So she was not the problem of the movie. Um, the problem, I think, was some of the writing, but also, um, and this brings me back to kind of like the stand mini, not the recent one, but the um, 90s miniseries. Like when that guy with the weird eyes was just hulking minute. I was like, that looks kooky. It doesn't fit with the setting. I know it's with the story, but it just didn't work. And it just took me out of the element. And I thought it was just silly as hell. I give them props, though, because it was it is probably still the only film that's done a proper and disgusting degloving of the hand. That I thought was phenomenal. But sorry, Ben, I didn't like that film. So that I did not, okay. you didn't choose mine. So I'm okay with that. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Yudaka, since you're all talk about your choice, why don't you go next? <laughs> well, if you hate this film, that's on you. But I went also with a Stephen King film and book and I chose Misery. You were going to say that. <sighs> it was, that <sighs> it, it was, it was, I know it's considered a horror film, but that was more sheer terror and captivity and isolation and, oh man. And I mean, I think James Kahn was great, but Kathy Bates was just phenomenal and she deserved that Oscar. And she's one of the few that I believe has won an Oscar in a horror role. So bravo, but the book is great. I that's a really I recommend that and the stand to read. Don't watch the stand film or miniseries. They're shit. <laughs> they will always be shit. Read the book. But um Misery was is my favorite adaptation. It's it's something I can always watch and every time it still kind of just gives me a little bit of chills because Kathy Bates is so Oh, ooh, so kind and then suddenly she'll snap and and, and yeah. the part where she breaks is oh god yeah yeah oh. so that's that's mine but i guess ben any thoughts on mine since i ripped yours to shred no i love fair. that film i really do and if we all go with the stephen king i do have a backup one that i can ooh. do so george um what are your thoughts on misery in gerald's game and what is your favorite horror adaptation so Gerald's Game, I really enjoyed, but I have always loved Car Carrier, Car 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 Carla Cagino. Carla Cagino, I think she's fabulous. I was obsessed with her since she was in Spy Kids, um, and so I really, really enjoyed that film. My friends were a bit like, "Oh, this is a bit weird," but I was, I was like, "It's well, one, it's Stephen King, so you expect yeah. something odd," and I understand the situation with the guy at the end it was a bit. Hmm. bizarre but I can't I was like you know what I enjoyed this but the fact that it was one room and and it was basically all set in there I thought was really really good and basically a huge monologue I really really enjoyed so I really I, I appreciate that one Ben I like that it was a, a bit of a left wing from the the many um Stephen King adaptations most of which have been terrible you talk I really love Misery I know that you really resonate with the character Kathy Bates's character so I, I understand why you chose that um but yeah I really like that I only actually watched a misery probably about five years ago like but I understand well one don't forget I'm younger than you so um I can't say that anymore because Ben's the youngest but so I I watched you know I I was I'd heard of it before I'd seen the film or read the book mm -hmm. um and so I watched the film and then, and then read the book after but I really really enjoyed it and I, I kind of enjoyed it that way because I really liked imagining the more obviously there was more in the book and seeing imagining Kathy mm -hmm. Bates kind of doing those other things I was kind of like do you know what this is I, I kind of like the way that I did that so I really like both of them I'm going with a non-Stephen King book Ooh, okay um and I'm going with one of my favorite horror books of all time and that is Rosemary's Baby um <gasps> in terms of from the book to the adaptation um Rowan Polanski's film it was one of the best adaptations I've seen specific to the book like if you read the book and you watch the film it is literally page by page I was like damn it is fantastic I, I love that film it's one of my favorite classic horror films of all time just the 
the build up within the film and in the book of you really just until the very end, you have no idea what is first first time viewers, no idea what is going on. And you are like, what in the world is happening here? And you can really, especially if you've seen the film and want to read the book, it's page by page. You can see the film going up. You can see Mia Farrow in your head. And fun fact, this isn't sponsored, but if Audible want to sponsor us on Audible, you can listen to the <laughs> audio book and it is actually narrated by Mia Farrow. <gasps> Which I is, will do that. I will do that then. Fantastic. There are a couple of others that nearly one Stephen King made it into the, my, you know, second, which was because I've got a soft spot for this film. Um, and that is the 2007 movie, The Mist. Oh, oh, God. I love that film so much. I cry every time and I really like oh. it. And only not just because Carol from The Walking Dead's in it. But um, I just think it's, a, well, actually, it's about five characters from Walking Dead, sorry. But yeah, I don't know. It was one of those films that I was like, when I was young, and I just love, I kind of like alien films as well, um, which we'll probably delve into at some point later in the podcast when we talk about films, themes and styles, dramas, whatnot. But yeah, that was my second. But I thought, Do you know what? I think everyone's going to go for a Stephen King. Also, I did have The Exorcist, which I know that Ben mentioned earlier, and The Invisible Man by G.H. Wells, because talking about the 2020 film in terms of adaptation i'm not saying that it's anything like the book but what i'm saying is to take that source material and to turn it into mm-hmm. uh that movie they did i think was really so they were my little honorable mentions but yeah for me rosemary's yeah. baby is my my top what do you guys think on on that one i i do love where um you said both your favorite and your worst. And when you said Rosemary's Baby, both men are like, oh, yeah, that's a good choice. Mm. And then your worst were like, yeah, that's that's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really enjoy that. Um, I Honorable mention. Um, well, actually, the worst uh, would be um, another Stephen King, uh, The Stand. Uh, if you've ever read that book, that book is terrifying. And it is so, uh, so good. And they've done two iterations, uh, both miniseries, both shit. Do not watch them. I don't care if it's got your favorite actor or actress. No, bye. It sucked. Um, Read the book. And then for um, second, as Ben had already mentioned to Silence of the Lambs. That was, I mean, good Lord. And they even just did a wonderful... Um, TV series Clarice uh, in my opinion but Silence of the Lambs is right there Rosemary's Baby was an excellent choice I didn't even realize that was based off of a book believe it or not so I might actually read that that seems like a very interesting reading experience Definitely. Um, there's there are two that I don't think anyone has mentioned that kind of odd but I understand why they haven't but it will be Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House um Mm-hmm. like when you talk about I think one of the finest pieces of supernatural horror um, ever put to screen I know it's a TV show but still just incredible and the turning has had the turn of the screw has had a lot of different um, it's had a lot of different adaptations and it's mm-hmm. inspired a lot of different films some terrible some really good and uh, I love The Haunting of Bly Manor, but I also think The Others was incredible. Yes. Like, really, really good. The Others was based off of a, a novel? Yeah. It took inspiration from The Turn of the Screw. The it's not... The screw. Oh. It's not really locked to it. Like, it, it doesn't... I don't think The Haunting of Bly Manor or The Others really marry themselves to The Turn of the Screw, but they do take inspiration from the bare bones of the story and they run with it. And I think they both did very interesting uh, takes on it. Mm-hmm. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, you see, there you go. I didn't expect to say Gerald's game to come up out of the Stephen King, actually out of the Stephen King books, if we were going to go Stephen King books, I didn't actually think about those two from, from you guys specifically. Anyway, mm-hmm. I was hoping that nobody was going to say it. Um, mm. Cause that's never been made. Rice, you can say what you want about the first one, but part two was shreadful. Oh, the first one was great, but that part two, yeah, it ruined everything. Yeah, and Tim Crow is the only good thing, thing about the, the miniseries, so um, I think we can agree on that. But yeah, the, obviously, you know, Stephen King is the obvious one, but none of the it films have anything about the turtle king, so you know, 
because no, no one yeah. wants to really go down that road. Um, but I think Stephen King's stuff as a whole is quite difficult. I don't think anyone's really, I know that we're both talking about those two films, but I don't think there's ever been one that I could solidly say, yes, this is, like, I think he's got, a, his style is, really needs to be read rather than, I think it's very difficult to visualise some of his things. I think Mike Flanagan did a really great job. Yeah. I agree. I think it was really um, well. T- the, I I actually preferred the Haunting of Blind Manor, which I know is a controversial, but that's because. Well, I'm sorry. I did. I thought I. We'll I talk really about guess- that eventually. I think yeah. if we ever talk about Flanagan, if yeah. we talk about is it TV shows. Tania Miller. Tiana Miller is the greatest thing that's ever happened to um, yeah. acting and television and that series. <laughs> Don't forget, guys. You can tweet us your favorite horror adaptations and let us know what you thought, and we can. We can debate that on Twitter and Instagram. Well, that is it for today's episode, our premiere episode. I don't know about you guys, but that was a lot of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I want to, of course, thank thanks you. everyone for listening. And you can join us again next week where we'll be continuing the Fear Street talk and reviewing and dissecting Fear Street 1978, Fear Street Part 2. As well as that, of course, it is going to be set at Camp Nightwing? Nightwing or Wing Night? I was like, I didn't know I was making it up that it was Nightwing. But it's going to be set, of course, in the one of horror's classic locations of a camp. And so in honour of that, we are going to be also discussing our favourite camp-located horror films from the likes of Friday the 13th, The Cabin in the Woods. We're going to talk about it all. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you haven't already, go and follow us on social media. We're actually on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow us there to keep up with all the latest information and news. And also, if you have any questions or any thoughts on Fear Street, you can tweet us and we will read them out in the episodes and we can talk and see if we agree or if we don't agree. It'll be something really exciting. So once again, thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next week. So it's goodbye from me. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. (laughs) Bye, guys. See you next week. You have been listening to the Horror Hour. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Horror Hour TV. And you can also follow our YouTube channel where we will be posting behind the scenes footage, video highlights, and full interviews.